Welcome to the wonderful world of finance and balance sheet review. So this is such an important, simple, um, and easy view of, you know, we talk about companies that are publicly traded. We talk about things that are called IPOs, initial public offerings. So these are companies that at one time were private that have now decided that they will be traded on the stock market. Um, and you gain shareholders this way you become a public company and companies do this to raise money to invest um, back into the company and to continue to generate more revenue and grow that's really the short of it um, but what's important I think that you guys as readers and obviously potential investors as well is you know if you're either considering investing if you're thinking about working in finance if you're thinking about working in accounting whatever that may be that you're able to correlate some of the technical information that you get in school and you know what that actually means outside of the textbook outside of sample questions that might be prepared for you and you know how you can really look at that in everyday real life terms so i thought it would be exciting if we picked on our friends over at Apple, you can see right here. So all I did was I went to Yahoo Finance and in the search bar, I entered Apple. I hit search and it brought me to Apple and we can get information about uh, the current trading price on the stock exchange, um, which is beyond the scope of what we really want to talk to now. But what I want to focus on for this demo is the balance sheet. So if we go down here to this menu bar of sorts, you would click on financials and it would take you to this very same page and you'll see that the very first one that pops up is the income statement, they had the balance sheet and the cash flow statement. So for now, we're gonna click on balance sheet just to tie into our discussion of learning about assets. So what they have for us here on Yahoo Finance is um, period over period comparisons, which is always amazing. So here we have the most recent publicly made available balance sheet is the September 29th, 2018, so about two months ago. And then prior to that, we have the last year and then uh, 2016 and 2015 as well. So what I want to just focus on today is looking at the asset section of the balance sheet just to tie into um, if you've followed along in previous content that I've posted just how to determine where things fall on the balance sheet why they're reported and as such and you know what the real value is in the numbers that we're looking at so let's try to dissect Apple's position here and I really try to do my best to do this in terms that are non-technical and can speak to as many people as possible so what we start off here with always is the name of the spreadsheet, sorry, this is the financial statement that we're looking at and for the balance sheet for the period ending. So like I said, this is September 29th, 2018 and our balance sheet structure will always start with current assets. So the logic behind this is, is that if we need to um, liquidate quickly if we need to get cash in our hands as a company immediately this is the area where we're expected to be able to get money quicker than other areas of assets okay so cash is cash obviously so if we need to liquidate we go to our bank we go to the bank accounts and we're able to immediately have access to uh, 25 million nine hundred and thirteen thousand dollars fantastic that makes logical sense then we go in the next component uh, the next component that is the easiest to liquidate and it would be their short-term investments so as we look at this we have 40 million uh, 388,000 in short-term investments available um, due within a period of 12 months okay so that is something that we also have to take into consideration what this is telling us is that these short-term investments, whether they be um, in terms that we understand more uh, for uh, common folk, um, you know, whether it's an RSP that matures within 12 months or a mutual fund that's maturing within 12 months, 12 months is generally accepted as the time frame that we will use current assets. So what you have to remember is that when you see short-term assets, 
under the current asset section of the balance sheet, what this company is saying is that we hold 40 million in short-term investments that are expected to mature within 12 months. Why is that important? Because if they're locked in um, beyond 12 months, then, then we get into that issue with being able to access that capital. So that's why we know that by putting it under the current asset section as a short-term investment, that we're not locked in for a period greater than 12 months. And if we need this money, when we're thinking about the cash that we're going to need within the next 12 months, we know that this might become available to us. And that's how you really have to wrap your head around um, in terms of the placement of your asset items, whether they're current or long term, because you could very easily have investments that mature in four years but you wouldn't put them under the current asset section because you cannot touch them within the next 12 months. So I hope that that piece makes good sense to you because it's really important in how you're able to analyze the balance sheet. The next one is net receivables. So accounts receivables, any money that is owed to you from customers, um, potentially notes receivable if you've lent out money um, within the company or outside of the company, and then any allowances that you have as a contra asset against your receivables, um, separate discussion, um, will net into this net receivables figure. So what they're saying here is that they, so Apple, is owed $48,995,000. What you can infer um, from this is that they will have almost $49 million in cash coming back to them within the next 12 months. Okay, so that's key. When we're thinking about cash flow, when we're thinking about the health of a company, this is really good information to be uh, aware of what money is coming back into the company. The next one is inventory, about four million in inventory. Fantastic, um, that one's pretty straightforward. This is the goods or products that you might sell that you have on hand. And any uh, other current assets could be uh, numerous things, very different things, um, and they've got them listed here as uh, 12 million. So as always, when it comes to format, we're going to sum the total so here we have total current assets of 131 million dollars fantastic we want to know you know we don't want to sit and have people uh you know pulling out their calculators and adding up what the total amount of all these current assets is so it's proper and good format to create this subtotal for total current assets so it's highly visible for anybody who's reading the balance sheet and you know if it comes to you in terms of presenting or preparing balance sheets yourself Make sure that you are in the habit proper form of um, creating this subtitle, uh, sorry, the subtotal and advising immediately put it out there what that total amount of current assets is. You don't, the last thing you want is to have people having to make manual um, uh, calculations with the work that you're preparing. You can give them as much as possibly, um, as, you, as much as you possibly can to really help them spend more time reviewing and less time reworking what you've already done. So after current assets will come the long-term assets. So we have, like I said, long-term investments. So we can see here, they reported 40 million short-term and they have 170, almost 171 million in long-term investments. So you can see that they've chosen, um, you know, strategy-wise to invest a great deal in longer-term, longer maturing investments obviously in the hopes of generating a greater return and then taking that money and investing it back within the company. Property, plant, and equipment. This could be anything from the equipment within the buildings, the, the equipment used uh, machinery-wise to create the products, to create the phones, to create the iPads, the MacBooks, whatever it is, whatever they own. Um, property, plant, and equipment can be lumped up for presentation purposes into this one figure. So we see 41 million. We've talked um, a little bit about intangibles in prior content. They have no goodwill, which is an intangible. Remember, tangible assets, the items you can see, you can feel, you can touch. Intangibles are those things that are not of that sort. Um, copyrights, trademarks, patents, incorporation costs, all of those things. They all have a value to the company, 
because of brand recognition, uh, proprietary rights to, to creating the products and the software and all of that stuff. But we cannot touch these things, but they still have a value that you have to try and measure. And we report them as such as well on the balance sheet because they are of um, economic benefit to the company. So you have to find the way to value it and uh, report it on the balance sheet. We have nothing reported for accumulated amortization. Uh, it could just be netted off within PP&E. And other assets could be any sort of uh, longer term assets that the company holds. And any um, balance sheet will have notes to it that follows, especially if you're a publicly traded company. So uh, notes to explain exactly what makes up this 22 million will be presented elsewhere without question. And again, we're always going to make sure that we subtotal. And what we see here is that Apple is saying that for the period ended September 29th, 2018, they have total assets in the amount of 365 million. And now we can kind of look at this balance sheet and kind of think back to the terms of current asset intangibles, long terms, etc. And we can really kind of hopefully just get a sense of, okay, so we start off with current because we want to know if we need cash right away which items are the ones that we're going to be able to get rid of the quickest to put cash in our hands. And that's how, that's the logic behind how the balance sheet is built. And we start with the, the item that's obviously the most easiest cash is cash. There's no conversion required. And then we move into investments and receivables, which is essentially cash in hand as well. Our inventory and any other item, any other asset items that we might have that are considered current and always remembering that within 12 month period that that's the key determining factor between whether we report something as a current asset or in the following section as a long-term asset. The other key thing to remember is that we want to put in the subtotals. We want to make the reading of the balance sheet as simple and straightforward as possible for the user, for the reader. We don't want anyone to have to mess around and play around with calculations. Why? Not only is it a waste of time, but the idea and the theory behind it is, is that you know we don't want them to make errors because we expect that investors and shareholders and the creditors, etc., that they're going to be making some pretty important decisions based on the information that we've provided in our balance sheet. And we want to give them access to the most accurate and correct information as possible, making it the standard and the norm to include the subtotals is just one way to eliminate that human error factor. It's here for them to run with and start to base their investment decisions on. And then, like I said, anything outside of the 12 months, investments, property, plant, and equipment, your intangibles, if you have any um, amortization, etc., is going to be reported in the next section. And then we combine to show what our total asset position is. And if you want to have fun, then you can just start to compare to the prior period and just kind of get a sense of, you know, how the company is trending. And I always love to do this. I mean, if we just quickly took a stab at, without looking at, you know, sales and expenses and all of that, which all tie into where these numbers land. But we can see that, you know, Apple has remained pretty, pretty um, uh, static when it comes to their cash position. They've gone up about 5 million, which is great, but they haven't gone down, which is typically what you would like to see. You would like to see that they're able to maintain their cash position. Um, investments um, started at 20, up to 46, up to 53, down to 40. So like I said, these are short term. So this number is always going to be changing within that 12 month period. And the receivables uh, have gone up significantly, but you know that would make sense if their sales have, have gone up, then they would be owed more money. Um, it also could be an indicator that they're not able to collect money as as quickly as they should be. So there's a multiple there's multiple factors that will impact why receivables might go up. So you have to do a little bit more digging around, but you always want to pay attention to the trends, inventory, up and down, up and down, but nothing really. Um, and no major spikes uh, either way going on here to be concerned about. Um, if we look at the long-term investments, same idea as the short-term. You just kind of want to watch um, how far up and down they've gone. But remember, these could be uh, two, three, four, five, ten-year maturity. So you expect to see some fluctuation as older ones mature and new ones come in, etc. And property, plant, and equipment. Um, if it goes up, it means that they're buying. 
Okay, so that's that's a, a, a pretty straightforward one. What you can infer is that they've invested in machinery, equipment, tools, all kinds of different types of long-term assets, um, and they're using these assets to generate revenue. And what you would hope to see when you see a spike in uh, property, plant, and equipment is that hopefully there's a correlating spike in sales as well, because the idea is that when we invest in property, plant, and equipment, it's so that we can generate and earn more revenue. So hopefully they were able to um, achieve and see some of these gains within the same period so you would go back and look at your income statement and see you know how did they close um, on September 29th compared to the prior period and you know just a, a way to get a sense of whether or not the investment in the assets um, starts to pay itself forward so that's just a, a quick quick and dirty explanation of how you can look at that section but overall, we can see that they've remained pretty consistent in the last um, two periods in terms of total assets. So there's really nothing here that would trigger any concern. But again, more so, it's I wanted to make sure that you yourself, um, not only as an individual, but like I said, as a potential preparer of these statements or uh, as an investor or um, having to to just to really understand why we're using the balance sheet and why the identification and the separation between long term assets, current assets, intangible assets is so important. It's because they tell each of these items tells a very different story. And if we just netted them all together and called them all current, it actually wouldn't be the case. And in times of need and in times of struggle for a company, when they need to know exactly how much they have available to them immediately, having it all identified and reported separately is how you get visibility to that information. So hopefully you're able to, you know, if this is new and introductory to you, then it takes a little bit of a, absorbing and, you know, maybe come back and listen to it a couple times. But again, it's just making sure you understand why we find it necessary to report based on current long term, uh, long term and intangible and the message that that sends to the readers of these financial statements in terms of their expected position within the next 12 months. That is the key. The balance sheet tells a story and there's no better way for me to explain it than that.